Welcome to this week's edition of Good Books Radio. Audiobooks.com is the chief underwriter for Good Books Radio, which is produced by UTRGV Media Services for Rio Grande Valley Public Radio. And now, here's your host, Dr. W.F. Strong. Welcome to this week's edition of Good Books Radio. I'm your host, Dr. W.F. Strong, and I want to thank our underwriter, Audiobooks.com, where your first book is free. All you have to do is go to Audiobooks.com, sign up, and... um, you become a member of audiobooks.com, and then you get to, based upon a monthly fee of $14, you get to download a premium book each month and listen to it on any convenient device you have. So take advantage of that, audiobooks.com. We have a great book today, Rise of the Rocket Girls, The Women Who Propelled Us from Missiles to the Moon to Mars. Splendid, splendid book, and uh, written by Dr. Nathalia Holt. And we're going to talk to her in just a moment, but before we get there, I'd like to say I already had a wonderful interview with her two years ago for her best-selling book, Cured. It it was a a flawlessly researched book about the medical community's desperate search for a cure for AIDS. And so I'm delighted to have her come back and uh, talk about another wonderful book, The Rise of the Rocket Girls. In fact, I put... Uh, Nathalia Holt in the category of Mary Roach, an elite writer of science. And uh, there may be a few others that are in that category, but it it wouldn't take long to call the roll. This book has been highly praised, The Rise of the Rocket Girls. It has been praised, well, first of all, we want to point out, I want to point out that it's a New York Times bestseller. It was selected as an Amazon best book of April 2016. Entertainment Weekly said that it was one of the 10 books that you should read in April, and I'm sure June will be fine, or July. And I love this from L, who said it is one of eight books by women for Bill Gates to read this summer. And you should read it this summer, too. I like Gene Seymour, who had high praise for this book. He said, it is illuminating. These women are vividly depicted at work, at play, in and out of love, raising children, and making history. What a team, and what a story. Another that I really like here is from uh, Tara Shee Nesbitt, best-selling author of Wise of Los Alamos. She said, I stole sleep to finish this book and was happy to do so. I admire how Holt gives voice to a group of important and lesser-known female scientists who have in the past been overshadowed by their male counterparts. So uh, that's enough of the praise. It goes on and on. There's, uh, my goodness, you know, 25... uh, glowing reviews from every corner of the publishing world, particularly from the science world. Nat, welcome. How are you the t- How are you today? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. Oh, I'm delighted. Uh, is it true that you came upon writing this book while you were looking for a name for your your daughter? It is true. Yes, it started in 2010, and my husband and I were expecting our first baby, mm-hmm. and we were just having a really difficult time coming up with baby names. Yes. We would make these long lists, and none of them seemed right. And then it was my husband who suggested the name Eleanor Francis, mm-hmm. and I liked it, but I wasn't sure, and so I did what parents do these days, and I Googled the name. And the first person to pop up was a woman named Eleanor Francis Helene. Mm-hmm. And my Google search had this beautiful picture of her, and it's taken at NASA in the 1960s, and she's accepting an award. And when I saw this picture, I was just stunned by it. I had no idea that women worked at NASA at that time, much less as scientists, so I really wanted to learn more. And I found through this, just through this search, that there was this whole group of women working at NASA, and they started in the 1940s. I, that was a shock to me, too. I, I mean, the whole book was a shock in, in uh, realizing that women were such an integral part of uh, the space program from the very beginning. I, I, I had no idea. Yes, for me, too. And, I, you know, as, as, a, as a woman who has a Ph.D. in microbiology, mm-hmm. I consider myself well-versed in the contributions of women scientists. Mm-hmm. And so to come across this group of women who had such long careers and were such a critical part of NASA was just thrilling. It was so much fun to learn their stories and to track them down and, and hear their stories directly from them. Well, before we get to those stories, I want to get your story. Uh, you have a Ph.D. in microbiology from MIT. Where are you from? So 
I, uh, it's actually from the University of Southern California, okay. and then I came to Boston, and I did my postdoc at Harvard, and so I've worked at a number of different institutions here in Boston. Okay. And, uh, but you, you were connected to MIT and Harvard, and you, you work for something that's, that uh, connects all of those in some way? Yes. Yeah, I worked for a long time at the Reagan Institute. Okay. And this is of MGH, MIT, and Harvard. Okay, that's that's where I'm getting the, the MIT part. And how did you go from, uh, you know, your research work to being a scientific journalist? Yes, it's funny. You never know where life is going to take <laughs> you. It certainly wasn't what I was expecting. Um, but I feel really fortunate that I've gotten to do this. I, so I wrote the, a book on HIV, mm-hmm. but through my research and writing this book on Rocket Girls, I just decided that I really wanted to take the plunge and make this book happen, and it, it needed me full-time to work on it. Mm-hmm. And I was really very lucky and very thrilled to do so. And and, and that's that was the other thing that surprised me, having interviewed you uh, concerning Cured, and uh, and then to come back and see that your second book is in a in, you know to my mind an entirely different universe. Uh, so how did uh, is that odd to you? Is that a, a leap, or is it all connected? Yeah, for me, you know, I I researched this story for a very long time, mm-hmm. not knowing if it was going to be an article or a book, just knowing that I had to find out about this history. I really became obsessed with finding these women, <laughs> learning their stories, and it just it just took me down this path. I've always loved NASA. I've always loved the space program, and so to be able to learn these stories of what these early days at NASA were like, up even through today, it was just so much fun. So it wasn't a difficult decision for me to make. Well, a lot of these women that you track down um, are quite elderly now, aren't they? They are. You know, they're mostly in their 80s and 90s, but their memories are vivid. Mm-hmm. And that was really a surprise to me as well, to, that they could so specifically detail what these missions were like, what it was like in the control room during Uh these pivotal moments in our space history was really fun to hear and write about. How did they, uh, one of the things I was surprised about, and I know a lot of people are, is the term computers, because it was the first time I ever came across it in your book that computers was a noun for people, uh, you know, not for a machine. And that, that was a whole new concept to me. Was it to you? It was. It was very surprising to me, but for most of history, a computer has simply meant a person who computes, Mm -hmm. and laboratories would need to hire large numbers of these computers in order to perform the calculations for their experiments. And so, yes, that's how these women got started, is by being hired as computers. And what did they do as computers, and why did they hire women uh, to do this? Were there men who did this too, and they just had a few women, or were women particularly good at it? What 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 made, because um, I know in the, in the Jet Propulsion Lab, they had a, a core of women, and one, one of the, the women leading the group only hired women. Yes, and that's really what, what caused this really strong group to form at JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory mm-hmm. in California. So you had men and women who both worked as computers in the 1930s and 1940s. And then during World War II, you certainly had fewer men in these positions, and women um, typically rose to this prominence as computers and laboratories all over. But the situation at JPL was very unique, because at most of these laboratories, you still had male supervisors. But at JPL, they had a woman named Macy Roberts, who was made supervisor in 1942. And she decided when she was hired that she was only going to hire women. Hmm. And today, of course, this would be a lawsuit. (laughs) But her thinking then was that she wanted to create this really cohesive group. She wanted it to feel like a family. And she worried that if she hired men, they wouldn't listen to her because she was a, a woman. Probably true in that time. Yes, probably true. And she certainly hired a lot of women. Mm-hmm. And she hired... Uh, and they came, you know, from all different backgrounds. And she hired a black woman, which was quite extraordinary. She 
did. She hired Janez Lawson, and Lawson had gotten her degree in chemical engineering from UCLA. Mm -hmm. So today, she would just be hired as an engineer, but back then she was hired as a computer, Mm -hmm. and she ended up having a, a very important career. She was one of the first sent to IBM training schools. She was one of the very first computer programmers Mm -hmm. at the lab. And she did eventually become an engineer, like so many of this group of women did. So what these women were doing is they were essentially writing code before there were computers to put the codes into. Yes, exactly. It was like the forerunners of our computer code today because they would fill up notebooks with these Mm -hmm. long strings of equations and they were working on early rocket fuels and looking at trajectories of of the early missiles. They worked on the Sargent and Corporal missiles at JPL. Mm -hmm. And and, uh, most of these women, when they were in college, they were the only women in their classes, right? Yes, I heard that story over and over again. And they didn't all have college degrees. Mm -hmm. Many of them only had high school diplomas, Mm -hmm. uh, but they all loved math. Mm -hmm. They all just took as much math as they could. And so I I think it must have been quite an experience for them to go from being the only girl in their classes to then part of this group of women at the lab. Well, let's go backward uh, to the formation of uh, the Jet Propulsion Lab because that's an interesting story of itself, just uh, essentially a bunch of nerds playing with rockets that uh, grows up to be something magnificent. But in the beginning, people just probably thought they were weirdos out there playing playing around dangerously with rockets. Yes, they really did. It's such a funny group, the founders of this laboratory. They're not at all who you would expect. They were a very reckless group of young people known as the Suicide Squad. (laughs) And they received this name because of these crazy experiments they did. They sent up a fountain of nitrous dioxide on the Caltech campus, which ruined landscaping. (laughs) And they then set off an explosion that rusted a very expensive new wind tunnel. And then finally, they set off another explosion that took off a piece of the building that fell down and rained on students below. And it was at this point that Caltech finally said, enough, you guys have to leave campus. Mm -hmm. And so they went to this isolated canyon in Pasadena and started doing their experiments then. And at the time, rocket science was frowned upon. It wasn't seen as a serious pursuit. Mm -hmm. And because of this, it was very difficult for them to continue these experiments and get any funding at all. But finally, with the beginning of World War II, the U.S. decided to make its first investment in rocket research, and that went to this crazy group known as the Suicide (laughs) Suicide Squad. Squad. (laughs) (laughs) And and you point out in the book that uh, this may not have really uh, gone anywhere had it not been for one of the one of the ladies who was hanging out with these guys, or a part of them, rather, uh, who was really good in math, and she could uh, actually, you know, test some theories of of uh, flight and, and propellants, et cetera, based upon her knowledge of math, right? She was certainly an essential part of the operation. Mm-hmm. She and her husband were the first employees that the Suicide Squad hired, and their names were Richard and Barbie Canwright, and they were both just exceptional at math, and Mm -hmm. so they worked along with this group. They were working on something called JADO at the time, which Mm -hmm. is called Jet Assisted Takeoff. And you'll notice that they didn't put rocket, even even in the term then, they wanted to still not even mention rockets because they were kind of in bad repute still. Uh Um, But but why why were were the... Essentially... Why was that? Why were rockets... Why did they have a bad reputation? It wasn't... It wasn't seen as a serious scientist okay. to be a rocket scientist. And there was, you know, there was this real feeling in the scientific community that it would be impossible to ever send a rocket out of Earth's atmosphere. Hmm. That it, it was, what they were doing was really just a fool's mission to be trying hmm. to do that. And yes, I have a, a great quote from a very famous engineer at MIT who said derisively of the group, at JPL that he didn't understand how a serious scientist or engineer could play around with rockets. <laughs> and that, that's how people felt. People didn't understand why you would want to do that. 
Well, uh, uh, right along that line is your discussion of the of the first um, actual computer that they bought from IBM, and uh, you talk about that a little bit. They bought the you know these enormous computers that took up so much space and weighed so much, and and Watson, president of IBM at the time, said that he predicted that uh, they would sell how many. He thought they would sell five, <laughs> and they ended up selling 19 of these IBM 701s. So this was the first commercially available computer from IBM. And it was very surprising how excited laboratories across the country were about this computer. It was giant. Mm -hmm. It was about 20,000 pounds, so it needed <laughs> 20, huge pounds. air conditioned space. Uh, it was moved by air freight. To California. And what's funny to me is that it was very expensive, too. It cost about $12,000 a month for JPL to have this machine at the lab. Wow. But what's interesting is that the men at JPL weren't interested in learning computer programming. It hmm. all fell to this group of women computers to be the first ones to start programming the IBM. And that trend would continue at JPL, even as new computers came in. And this was very surprising to me, because I really expected that once IBM's gained a foothold in the lab, the women would leave. And mm -hmm. this is what happened at most NASA centers. At most NASA centers, once digital computers came in, human computers lost their jobs. Mm -hmm. But this didn't happen at JPL, and it really speaks to the women that worked there and the, the culture they were in. And these uh, these IBM computers of the time uh, couldn't even do what uh, a smartphone can do today, right? Oh yes, not mm -hmm. not not even close. Uh -huh. So they they boasted that they could do sixteen thousand operations a second, mm -hmm. uh, which is very exciting. But they had frequent flare-ups. The computer often overheated. So the IBM 701, even though it was so expensive and so huge, it often sat unused. <laughs> they still did most of the calculations by hand. <laughs> well, there's a, one of the things I've, I found amusing there was that they, they paid uh, what, what in today's dollars would be 100000 a month to rent this thing, and, uh, and they, it didn't come with an owner's manual. <laughs> you just had to figure <laughs> yeah. it out, you know? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't suppose they had tech support anywhere, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there wasn't much tech support, so they really relied on the women. The yes. women were the ones, you know, that were sent to these mm. first IBM training schools. Janez Lawson was one of the yes. very first. So, so that was quite, a, she was quite the groundbreaker, wasn't she? She was an African-American who got a job, which was very difficult. I remember you said that uh, uh, Maddie, is that her name, Maddie uh, who had to go and ask if she could hire her? Yes, that's Macy Roberts. Macy, and yes, yes Macy. There was quite a discussion when she was hired, and mm -hmm. Macy Roberts really had to vouch for her. There was a, a real question whether or not the white employees would feel comfortable having an African-American working mm -hmm. alongside them. She was the first African-American hired in a, in a technical position like this in the laboratory, um, and it, Macy Roberts really went out of her way to make sure that she joined the lab. She really mm -hmm. believed in her, mm -hmm. as well she should. Lawson was so intelligent, and she had such a brilliant career. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, she herself said that uh, she felt that engineering and math types were less prejudiced than others because they were just focused on the purity of the science and all. Yeah, I thought that was interesting mm -hmm. that she felt that way. Mm -hmm. She really loved working in the lab. Mm -hmm. It wasn't easy for her, I'm sure. I'm sure it must have really been a, a struggle to be having this long commute that she had from L.A. to Pasadena mm -hmm. along highways that weren't very well constructed at the time. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of traffic. It yes. wasn't easy for her. Um, but she, she loved being in the lab, and she loved the friends that she made there. Now, in, when they were, were testing these rockets out in New Mexico at White Sands, did, uh, they, the, the women didn't go out there to see uh, their work, right? I mean, once in a while maybe, but they didn't really go very often out to White Sands? It was very rare mm -hmm. for the women to go out there. That was 
really just the male engineers that would go out there to test the missiles and rockets. And so what the women would do is they would watch as they all got packaged up. <laughs> uh, some of these missiles were huge. The corporal required this very, very long caravan of, of trucks to send it off to New Mexico. Um, but they they certainly felt for these missiles. They you know they spent so much time working on them that the failures would get to them as much as it did anyone else in the lab. Mm-hmm. It could be hard sometimes. Oh, I, lo- I love the the description. I, maybe you can read the part because it's beautifully expressed. Where the uh, one of the women said that uh, when she witnessed the rocket that she had done all the math for go 60,000 feet into the sky, she felt like it had written her name up there. Something like that. But uh, you know which one I'm talking about? I think I do. I think that's probably Barbara's description Mm -hmm. of the corporal. Yes. And that's one of the missiles. I'm not sure exactly where that is in the book, but that's one of the missiles that they ended up signing. Everyone Mm -hmm. signed it Uh at the lab that had worked on it. And then that missile actually ended up exploding and just was scattered across the desert. Mm-hmm. And even today when I talk to Barbara about that missile, she, you could still hear the sadness <laughs> in her <laughs> voice about that <laughs> loss. I think it really hit them hard. And then there was the other one that went, uh, I forget whether it's the one before or uh, the description of the, you know, they, they were so used to things failing that they were going to launch one, you know, to go higher than anything had ever been before. And they you know, just kind of expected it to explode before it got there. But everything went beautifully. Everything went without a hitch and it went, you know, 100 and almost into space. And they were just thrilled. They, they felt their hard work was done and now they were off to the races. <laughs> yes. It was interesting to me to learn just the time pressure they were under. All of these tests were done so quickly. They had to be so careful with their calculations because there were accidents that occurred because of the pressure they felt in, in getting the, the, the speed for these rockets and missiles. So it, it is, it's funny to imagine what that must have been like to want to usher in these missiles as, as quick as you can, knowing that many of them will fail, but hoping that some of them will succeed and be successful weaponry. Another element of the book that is a little surprising is where you talk a, a bit about uh, fashion, about, you know, this would be a, a unique uh, uh, woman's problem in this world where men didn't have to worry about their <laughs> style of dress too much, but the, these women were <laughs> kind of tortured over it, uh, wanted to, uh, some of them always wanted to wear the high heels and wanted to wear pantyhose and wanted to look professional and well-groomed, and this was important to them. Yes, there's certainly a double standard in the lab, because mm-hmm. the men would come just in short sleeves and really weren't dressed up at all, Mm -hmm. and this was very unusual for some of the women who weren't used to seeing men in a professional capacity who were just so casual at work. Mm -hmm. Um, But the women didn't have this luxury of being casual, and so they still had to dress in stockings and heels, and they were still subject to these gender norms of the day, of course. Um, But it was fun to learn about what, what that was like and to see that changing over the course of their careers. So I really loved writing about pantsuits, which is not (laughs) something that I ever thought I would write about or find interesting. Um, But it was was fun to learn about how excited they were when they could finally wear pantsuits to work. (laughs) And so uh, is is it your belief that they... um Kind of, kind of invented them, or that they kind of um, launched the fashion. Oh no, they <laughs> didn't invent them or launch the fashion, but they were certainly excited to have them available. <laughs> As I'm sure were many other women at the time. Yes, yes, yes. I'm sure. How has your book uh, affected uh, young girls in STEMs programs and things like that? I'm sure that this has been into the hands of many teenage girls who feel isolated as uh, as lovers of math in a, in a still male world out there? 
Yes, I certainly hope that this book can reach young people, both boys and girls. Mm-hmm. And I've been fortunate enough to speak at a lot of schools. Mm-hmm. And even at my, my readings and my talks, I find mm-hmm. a lot of young people come to them. There is something so inspiring about this group of women that they were able to have these 50-year careers at the lab that they have touched just every NASA mission you can think of. Mm-hmm. And they really had to do it at a time when it was not common for women to have these roles and, and certainly not common to be combining motherhood uh, with this type of career. Um, so I, I, my real hope is that these women can ins- inspire and be role models for young people. I think it's, it's good to know that they were there, that they were such a, such a critical part of our history. Well, you know, even when you see f- uh, movies that are uh, retro that show these uh, you know, these institutions like the Jet Propulsion Lab and NASA and things in the early space launches. But you don't see women. You know, there may be one or two, but they're not <laughs> hardly there at all. You don't see them. And, and, and your history um, clarifies this, I think. It lets us see that women were playing quite a significant role. If it hadn't been for their yeah. computing, uh, a lot wouldn't have gotten done or would have been delayed. Absolutely. They were there from the very beginning. They were Mm -hmm. in the control room. They are, many of them have been the ones that have Mm -hmm. made a mission a success or declared it to the rest of the people in the control room. Um, So that it is, it's important, I think, to reveal the the role they've had. Now, as a woman who's spent her life in science, do do you see an improvement in um, opportunities for, for women in science today, or are there still huge stumbling blocks? Oh, there's absolutely improvement. I think it's it's really wonderful. We've had just some great things that have happened. This is the first year that the NASA astronaut class is half female, and the women that make up that astronaut class are, are really phenomenal. It's incredible what they've accomplished, and I'm so excited to see the explorations they're going to go on. Mm-hmm. Um, but that being said, there there are still a lot of challenges for women, especially in technology. Yeah. We've seen a big drop in women pursuing technology. Mm. So in 1984, 37% of bachelor degrees in computer science were awarded to women. And today that number has dropped to 18%. Wow. So we can certainly do a better job encouraging women to pursue careers in technology. Do you think... Do you think that it's a good idea, like some schools are doing, to uh, uh, teach women separate from, uh, teach girls separate from boys in terms of math and and, uh, calculus and that sort of thing? Uh, You know, the theory being that if you separate them from the boys, they will have better uh, focus and less intimidation, et cetera? Yes, I'm not sure. It's Mm -hmm. it's hard for me to say. I've seen some of that data that Mm -hmm. seems very convincing that you can help young women that way. Um, but it's, you know, I, I, I think it, it'll be interesting to see as we see that put more into practice in, in schools across the country. I've been very impressed with what a university in California called Harvey Mudd has done. They've made a number of changes to their curriculum that have really improved the number of women graduating in computer science. And so they've structured their introductory computer science classes in a way that that makes it easier if you have no prior experience in in programming or in computers to get in the door and and learn these early concepts. And then they've also increased research opportunities, and they're sending many of their women students to this Grace Hopper conference in computing. And by doing this, they have just just in a few years, made a very dramatic increase in the number of women graduating with degrees in computer science. Well, I'm glad they're developing new paradigms that uh, show promise. Unfortunately, we're out of time. We've got to wrap it up here, but I uh, just want to thank you again for joining us on Good Books Radio. We've been talking to Nathalia Holt for her new book, Rise of the Rocket Girls, The Women Who Propelled Us from Missiles to the Moon to Mars, a splendid book absolutely something you should read this summer and you should put this in the hands of every young girl who's uh, who dreams of, of a career in science a wonderful wonderful read inspiring for good books radio i'm your host dr wf strong 
You can listen to this uh, as a podcast on Good Books Radio YouTube channel or on our Facebook page, Good Books Radio. If you'd like to write to me, you can write to me at drwfstrong at gmail.com. For Good Books Radio, I'm signing off. Here's hoping that all your books are good reads. <laughs> <laughs>